Welcome to my switching routing and wireless essentials course. This should be the CCNA version 7 curriculum. This is the second of three courses. Welcome to switching routing and wireless essentials version 7. This is module 14 routing concepts. So what are we going to be covering in this course? We're going to be looking at path determination, how the routers actually route. We're going to review a basic configuration of a router. We're going to examine an IP routing table, and we're going to look at static and dynamic routing protocols. So let's go ahead, let's jump into our path determination. So essentially, a router will receive a packet, and it needs to determine how to forward that packet, what interface should that packet go out of. The process of figuring that out is known as routing. Typically, a router will have a ingress and egress port or interface, but that's not always the case. The primary function of a router is to determine the best path to forward packets based off of the information in its routing table. Essentially, it will be forwarding the packet towards their destination using the routing table. The route table can be learned through static or dynamically learned information, and we're going to get to that in a later section of this. So let's look at an example. Here we have one LAN and another LAN. If we have a person over here, they will send the packet to the default gateway, the router. The router will look at the packet and figure out how to process it. The router has to know the, what port to send information. If it knows that this LAN is connected to this router and this router is off of that interface, that's what it will do. It will forward that packet out this interface so that this router can receive it and then process it along. This is what the route table would look like. And you'll see here it has a statically configured route, two directly connected routes, and we have that S learned route. That S learned route will be sending anything out that interface destined for that network. So this router will go, okay, I need to send a packet to that network. Send it to that IP address, which that's going to be that guy right there. As this information grows, if we had multiple routers, it would do the same thing, except it would be the next hop. Here we only have the two routers, so we have that pretty simple. So the best path will normally equal the longest match. And the best path is, is basically the route in the routing table, and that's called the longest match. The routing table will contain route entries consisting of a prefix, the network address, and the prefix length, the subnet. For there to be a match between the destination IP address of a packet and a route in the routing table, a minimum number of far left bits, network bits, must match between the destination and the destination IP and the destination network. The longest match is the route in the routing table that has the greatest number of far left matching bits for the destination. Basically, the greater number of network bits that match the destination IP and the destination network, that will be the longest match. The term prefix length will be used to refer to the network portion of the host bits for both IPv4 and IPv6 throughout the remaining Cisco courses. So let's look at an example. Here we have the destination IP and we have three route entries. So we're going to be looking to see which route entry has the most matching bits and that's going to be You'll notice Route 1 has this many, has 12, where Route 2 has 18 matching bits. Route 3 has 26 ma uh, matching bits. This will be the route 
the longest match for that IP address. So it will then use this route to forward the packet destined for that network. If we're talking IPv6, again, we're, we're doing the exact same thing. We're breaking down the host bits and we're seeing which ones match. Here we have 40 bits, 48 bits, and 64 bits, but you'll notice the 64 bits does not match. So we're going to be looking at the 48 bits. Those will be the ones that do match. Again, here we have the 48 bits that do match, but then between 48 and that 64, we have 5555, and those ones do not line up to the destination. So that route does not count. So the longest match is route entry 2 because of the 48 bits that do line up. So building the routing table, we have a few different things that are tied to the routing table. Directly connected networks are added to the routing table when the local interface is configured with an address and is active. Those are going to be the C and L networks. We have remote networks that are not directly connected to the router and the router will learn about these in one of two ways. Either statically configured static routes or dynamically routing protocols those will be router updates sent by other routers that will update the current routers information and we're going to be focusing in on static routing in this course the third course we will get into dynamic routing protocols and kind of how they function so the last way that a route gets in the routing table is the default route, which will specify basically the next hop router to use if nothing else matches. And that's typically denoted with a slash zero prefix. And it basically just states, hey, all else fails, send this there. So how do packets get forwarded? This forwarding methodology is also important to understand for the exam. So again, a packet forwarding decision process tree is made up of these five steps, essentially. The data link frame with a encapsulated IP packet arrives on the ingress interface, so it's coming into the router. The router will examine the destination. It will decapsulate the frame, pull the IP packet datagram out of the frame. It will examine the destination IP address in the packet header, and it will look at the routing table. The router will find the longest matching prefix in the routing table. The router will encapsulate the packet in a new data link frame and then forward it out the appropriate egress interface. The destination could be a device connected to the network or it would, could also be a next hop router. It kind of just depends. If there is no matching route and there is no default route set, the packet will be dropped. So again, if there is no exit interface that was identified by the longest match and there was no default route, then the destination is undeliverable. Packets get dropped. So it's interesting because after a the router has determined the best path, it could do uh, the appropriate action. Well, it should do the appropriate action. It should forward the packet to a device on a directly connected network. That is always going to be the highest priority. The best route will always be the most trustworthy. And directly connected routes are normally viewed as the most trustworthy. And again, it has to encapsulate the IP packet into an Ethernet frame. And the router will determine the appropriate MAC address to send it to. Because again, IPs operate at layer 3, MAC addresses operate at layer 2. And it needs to be broken down into layer 1 bits to be sent over a wire. So the IP packet has to go to a frame, that frame has to go to bits, and then forwarded. It has to be forwarded out a physical interface, which the MAC 
actually controls. That is why the IP packet has to be encapsulated into a frame. And then again the frame into bits. The frame will be switched at each hop because again the frame will be just be the destination MAC address of the next hop. So if there's multiple routers along a path, the frame will be replaced by the, des the next destination hop each router or at each hop. So if there is a next hop router, instead of it being directly connected, the route entry will indicate the destination IP address of the remote network and where to send it. The packet will be then forwarded to the next hop router and the next hop router address is indicated in the entry table. It will say send to this IP address. It will then typically find a MAC address, maybe using ARP, maybe using ICMPv6 neighbor discovery for IPv6, and then it will use that information to figure out what the MAC address is for the next hop, and then it will then send to that next hop. The difference is that the router will search for the IP address of the next hop router in the ARP table or its neighbor cache instead of the destination IP address of the next packet. Again, here you need to understand, because a directly connected network, the MAC addresses will, should already be known because they're directly connected. With the next hop, they are not always directly connected. Thus, you need to figure out the appropriate MAC address address to send it through. This process will vary for the other types of layer two networks because we talked about Ethernet frames, and that is just one of the layer two networks. And again, if there is no match in the routing table, the packet will be dropped. The primary responsibility of packet forwarding function is to encapsulate the packets in the appropriate data link frame type. Again, we talked about Ethernet, but that's not the only one. A data link frame format could be a serial point to point, a High-level data link layer like HDLC, could be frame relay, could be others. Realistically, most of what we learn about will be Ethernet frames, but they are not the only ones. Other packet forwarding mechanisms um, are out there. So again, the primary responsibility of the packet forwarding function is to encapsulate the appropriate frame types and then to forward those frames using the appropriate mechanisms. The three main mechanisms are process switching, fast switching, and Cisco Express forwarding, which we've discussed these in great detail when we talked about switching, but these also happen for packets. So again, process switching is an older packet forwarding mechanism that's still available on most Cisco routers. Basically, when a router receives a packet on an appropriate interface, it is forwarded to the control plane where the CPU will match the destination address to it in an entry in the routing table, and then it will determine the appropriate exit or egress interface, and then forward it to that interface. It is important to understand that the router does this for every single packet, even if the destination is on the same stream of a packet. The crappy part with that is, that is CPU intensive. So with fast switching, it's also an older forwarding mechanism, which was a successor to process switching. Fast switching will use a fast switch cache to store next hop information. So it doesn't always have to go to the control plane and the processor. So if the packet is known and in the fast forward cache, it doesn't have to go to the control plane or processor. If it's not in the cache, then the packet would have to be sent to the control plane, processed, information would then be stored in the cache, and then it would go at the appropriate egress interface port. Well, all of that was kind of changed with the Cisco Express forwarding, CEF. This is the most recent and is currently the default iOS packet forwarding mechanism for Cisco devices. CEF will build a forwarding information base, a FIB, and an adjacency table. The table entries are not packet triggered like fast switching, but change triggered. 
such as when something is changed in the network topology, then the information will be updated. When a network has converged, the FIB and adjacency tables will contain all the appropriate information that the router will need to consider the appropriate next hop or forwarding decision. So, moving on, let's talk about basic router configuration. So, let's consider this type of topology. We have two routers and we have an ISP, a third router, off of router 2. So, here we have a IPv4 and IPv6 network. So, we need to have R1 understand that the default route to go to the internet is to send to R2. So if we're looking at the configuration, we have the basic host name, uh, password, synchronization, uh, securing SSH and whatnot. We have a banner. We have the appropriate IPv6 address information configured. We have the interfaces turned on and saved. But you'll notice we don't have a lot of route information. This literally is just basic addressing and no route information. So in order to configure the router, we have to actually have route information so communication can flow. If we look at a basic switch and a router configuration, command structure is the same. A router will have addresses typically where a switch will not. I understand that switches as SVIs and that might have an address and whatnot, but the rest of the commands are pretty similar. But a router should have route commands explaining how to forward the appropriate information. And this does not. We're going to get to that in our next lesson because that's all about configuring and conceptualizing and understanding static routes. Anyway, so since we are looking at the basic configuration of a router, we need to understand some basic show commands. IP interface brief, uh, running config, uh, interface, uh, show IP route, and of course ping. Again, if we're dealing with IPv4, it will just be IP. If we're dealing with IPv6, instead of being show IP route, it will be show IPv6 route. But these are basic show commands that you should become familiar with and kind of understand what they do. Show IP interface brief will give us details on the route, or will give us details on the interfaces in a brief uh, comparison. If we're looking at route information, we want to do a show IP route, and that will give us the route information. If we want detailed interface information, that would be show IP interface. We can filter the commands with a pipe that is above enter, and we have the ability to filter it and to include one of these four additional commands, section, include, exclude, or begin. Where begin will be, this will display the output line from a certain point, starting with the line that matches the filtered expression. You can view output based off of section, or you can include certain things or exclude certain things. I don't want to see a, a thousand line config. I may only want to look at the route. So I will be show run and do a pipe and include or do a section just for the route information. So we do have a lab packet tracer for you to configure some of this. So let's move on to the next section, our IP routing table. So again, uh, the router learns information to build the routing table based off of directly connected, static routes, or our dynamic route protocols, or the default routes. Some basic symbols that you need to know in the routing table. Again, L and C are directly connected routes. S is a static route. O is one of the dynamic routes, and a default route will be designated by a star. L is identified the address assigned to a router interface, where C identifies a directly connected route. L and C 
are directly connected routes and they're slightly different. So know the differences between those two. So there are three routing table principles as described below that we need to understand. First, every router will make the decision by itself. Second, a router, up, a router will have a routing table and it may be different than the routing information in the next table. Third, routing information about a path does not provide return route information. They're talking one way only. So how do we decode the routing table? Here's an example. There are seven key steps in understanding the routing table. Route source, how did the route get learned? Destination, that's going to be where are we sending it? Three, administrative distance. This is basically the trustworthiness. The lower the value, the better. The metric, this will identify the value assigned to reach the remote network. Lower values indicated preferred routes. So again, lower the better. Next will be the next hop. This will identify the IP address of the next router to which the packet should be forwarded. A route timestamp. This will identify how much time has passed since the route was learned. And lastly is an exit interface. How do we send the data out and the which port? And you'll notice the same seven steps are the same whether we're talking IPv4 or IPv6. Directly connected networks, again, C or L. These are learned when the router is powered on and the interfaces are active and an IP address is assigned. Static routes are routes that were manually configured and there are three primary purposes for our static routes. It provides an easier way of router table maintenance though this is mainly for small networks it does not scale very well it will use a single default route to represent a path to any network that doesn't have a more specific match third it will route to and from a stub network in this example a stub network is a network accessed by a single route and the router only has one neighbor typically a static route is viewed as more secure because Nothing can change it as it is manually configured. Here is a manually configured IPv4 and IPv6 route. You will notice at the configuration section, IP route, our remote network and subnet, and then it will be our either our IP address of the next hop or the exit interface. The same general structure for our IPv6, except in IPv6, you will be using the slash notation instead of the dotted decimal notation. If we are looking at dynamically learned information, so with dynamic, each router is going to send information about the routes and the networks it has. So here, router one will send information to router two, and router two will send information to router one, and so forth. When they both have the same information, this will be called a converged network. So as we look at information in the routing table, you'll notice that the route information is learned via O. O is OSPF. So this is how the dynamic routing protocol, it will set the rules using OSPF to exchange that information. So notice that IPv6 routing protocols will use the link local address of the next hop router as opposed to the global unicast address. And OSPF routing configuration for IPv4 and 6 is outside the general scope of this video because this is actually part of the third course when we talk about OSPF more in depth. One thing to note also is while IPv6 will use the link local address, IPv4 will use the whatever IP address it has. They can both use exit interfaces as well, but they typically do not. The default route, again, here on R2, we will have a default route designated by zeros that will say 
send everything to the ISP. R1 will need to be given the route to send R2. And that is where the route origination will come into play. Because basically router 2 will have to tell router 1, hey, I have a default route. Here's the information. If you have a packet that's destined for a network that we're not sure of, send it to me so I can forward it on to our default route. In that case, it would be ISP. So, the structure of a routing table. Basically, IPv4 is standardized using the now obsolete classful addressing architecture. We now use class lists. So the lookup process still uses class A, B, and C. Directly connected networks will always be uh, indented like a child route. You'll have a main route that will be class A, B, or C, and they'll be indented uh, subroutes. Those are called child routes, and they will include the route source and all of the forwarding information, such as next hop, that will be useful. The class full network address of this subnet will be shown as the route entry. It's not as indented. The route is known as a parent route. So here, this is a class full address slash 24. Notice this will be the parent route. These are indented. These are child routes of this parent route. Same thing with this. This is the parent, these are the children. Parent, children, and so forth. What's interesting here is we have a slash 24. That means the first three octets should be identical. But here we have two routes that are learned that are not in that network. So that's kind of interesting. The child route will include the route source and all forwarding information, which we already know about. Class full network address of the subnet will be shown above. So here in reality, we are looking at the first 16 bits. And while we are still looking at the bits between 17 and 24, we're matching the 24th bit. And that's how we get this 2 and this Actually, that doesn't make sense either, because 2 would not have a matching 24th bit, because that would be the 23rd bit. So I'm not quite sure why these two routes are underneath this parent route, because they are not matching network bits. Alright, moving on. So the concept of a classful uh, addressing uh, was never designed with IPv6 in mind. So you'll notice the indentation are not the same. So an important concept was this administrative distance. You'll notice that here we have 110 out of 1. That administrative distance or that trustworthiness we need to understand. So first of all, AD, administrative distance, was developed so that we understand the trustworthiness of that route. The lower the number, the better. A route entry for a specific network address can only appear once it's in the routing table. However, it's possible to have multiple paths to the same destination. So how do we know which route to take? What we do is we take the most trustworthy route, and that's the route that is put into the routing table. So how do we know which is the most trustworthy? Basically, we ask two questions. How does the route know which source to use and which route should it install in the routing table? And again, we look at the AD value and that's how we decide. There are default AD values depending on the routing protocol used. If it is directly connected, it's a zero. Again, lower the number, the better. So directly connected routes and static routes will always be given priority. If we're talking EIGRP, it's going to be an 80 uh, number of 90. If we're talking OSPF, it's going to be 110. If we're talking RIP, it's going to be 120. Those are the ones you really need to know for the exam. 
EIGRP being 90, OSPF being 110, and RIP being 120. I've seen on the Cisco exam where they'll talk about 80 distances and not tell you the routing protocol or the route source. You're expected to know those three route sources and the appropriate AD values. Moving on, let's talk about static and dynamic routing. This is the last section in this video, but this is actually one of the more important ones. So again, static and dynamic routing are not mutually exclusive. It's not one or the other. You can do both. So a static route are commonly used for the following scenarios. Basically, a default route to the ISP for routes outside the routing domain that are not learned through some form of dynamic routing protocol. When you want to specifically or, or explicitly define the appropriate path to flow through a network. And there are some times where you want data to flow a very specific path for security reasons or because you are connecting to a stub network that you want to control traffic to and from. Static routes are useful for small networks, but as the network grows, the configuration of static routes becomes a little rougher. Dynamic routing protocols are implemented in any type of network consisting of more than a few routers. Basically, the routers will share information dynamically and they will update one another. So scalability are there. Routing uh, updates are automatically and learned with one another. Basically, the overall routing topology of a network can be automatically updated when you're using dynamic routing protocols, which means it's scalable, it's growable, it's easier to maintain. So dynamic routing protocols are commonly used in a few different scenarios. Again, the larger networks when there could be multiple changes and for scalability. If we are comparing and contrasting the two, dynamic routing is independent of network size. Static routes will increase the complexity of configuration the larger network grows. The topology changes, dynamic routing is automatic. Static routes, you have to have the admin make changes. Scalability is way easier on dynamic routing protocols and it doesn't really scale well with static routes. Security, dynamic routes, you need to configure it, whereas static routes, it, the security is built in. So static routes are typically classified as more secure. Resource usage, dynamic routes have to process these updates and these changes and whatnot, so they use more resources, where with dynamic routing, those resources means higher level router, more memory, more processor. With a static route, no processing is needed. Path predictability, dynamic routes will be path independent, where with static routes, the paths are explicit. So there are pros and cons for both. It just kind of depends on what you're trying to accomplish. We have a few routing protocols based off of our timeline. We're talking things like uh, EIGRP, RIP, RIP version 1, OSPF. The most common OSPF that we're going to be using is going to be OSPF v3. That's going to be created early uh, 2000s. We have things like BGP or RIP v2. All of the main routing protocols were developed in the 90s, even though it's 2020 and beyond. We still are using routing protocols from 20 plus years ago. So the most important question that I get asked the most is what are the routing protocols and how are they broken up? So we have two types of routing protocols. We have interior gateway protocols, IGPs, and we have exterior gateway protocols, EGPs. Basically, if we're talking who is going to manage it, it will be internal. If we're talking an external entity managing things, it will be an external or EGP. 
the internet is ran off of eGPs because again the internet is multiple ISPs that have to interconnect with one another. So an ISP might have their own IGP running that ISP collectively. But combining all of the IGPs will be a EGP. So I'm going to start with EGP because it's kind of the easiest. For IPv4, BGP is the main routing protocol that runs the internet. BGP is a exterior gateway protocol typically. I say typically because BGP can also be an interior gateway protocol, but that's part of the Cisco CCMP track and outside the scope of this exam. So we have our IGPs left. IGPs are broken down further into two main groups, distance vector and link state. The main takeaways from distance vector is distance vector will send the entire table to its neighbor where link state will only send the updated changes or the link information to its neighbors. So distance vector kind of sends more details than it needs to, where link state only sends the information that it needs to send. Distance vector is slowly going away and link state is kind of taking over. You'll notice in the next course, we're gonna be focusing on link state routing protocol OSPF because that is what's kind of making a break for the dominance in our IGPs. So moving on, a routing protocol is a set of processes, algorithms, messages. Basically it is the standard or structure that will be used to exchange route information. How to route one and route two exchange information. The routing protocol will define the rules that will be used to exchange that information. How do we discover network uh, remote networks? How do we discover when there's a change? How do we discover when to update one another? How do we choose the best path? Things of that nature will be defined by that routing protocol. The main components of a dynamic routing protocol are going to be the overall data structure. Basically how the routing protocol will typically use tables and databases for their operations and how it's stored in memory. The routing protocol messages, these are going to be the messages sent to and from and the message types will be varying types of messages that could be used to discover things like neighbor routes, how to exchange information, uh, how often should we check to make sure a route is up and alive, maintenance, and so forth. The last main component is the algorithm. The algorithm is a finite list of steps used to accomplish the tasks. And each message is basically will, will fill one of those tasks. How do I discover my neighbor? The algorithm will define how to do that and will define what messages to send and or receive to verify that information is accurate. The routing protocol will determine the appropriate best path route for each network. The route is then offered to the routing table. The routing table will accept the route and install it in the routing table for X amount of time. Again, lower the AD, the better. If there are multiple paths, the lower AD will always take precedence. And again, we already looked at the AD table, directly connected routes, static routes, and then the appropriate dynamic routes. Know the numbers. Best path is really depending on what protocol we are using. If we are using RIP, RIP uses the metric of hop count. If we are using EIGRP, this will be based off of metric uh, bandwidth and delay values. Basically, it will look at the cost of communication and it will try to send it through the paths that have the most bandwidth, the lowest delay, and are considered the most reliable. OSPF will use a metric of cost. This will be a cumulative bandwidth from source to destination. 
if I go from A to C, it will actually calculate the paths and the paths costs using the entire network to determine which path will be the most efficient path. So again, metric is going to be the important key word here. Each routing protocol may have a different metric or way of measuring which will be defined as the best path. And you do need to know what metric these three use it. So RIP will use hop count, OSPF will use total bandwidth, source to destination, EIGRP will be based on the slowest bandwidth and delay values, and it may include things like load and reliability. Moving on will be load balancing. So EIGRP is one of the only routing protocols that does support unequal cost load balancing, where the rest of the routing protocols, they need to have equal costs. Basically, if I have two WAN connections and they're both gigabits, how do I send data out of them? And if they are equal, we can load balance the egress out of both of them. If they are not equal, we have to use EIGRP. Typically, you're not going to find a router with two asymmetric or two symmetric exit points. You'll typically find a router with a primary internet connective interface and a backup internet connective interface, and they will be different speeds. Because again, why would you pay for two active connections of the same speed if one is just more of a backup? All right, so that is our routing concepts in a nutshell. We have uh, practice and quiz questions. We learned about primary functions of a router, how the router makes its determination, basic show commands. We learned about uh, packet switching, how static and dynamic routes work, and we did a quick comparison. We learned about how things like the FIB work. We looked about how the router table will use, uh, how routes are learned, to the destination, uh, the administrative distances, the metrics, the next hop. We did a quick overview of encapsulation between layer three and layer two. We just discussed basic dynamic routing protocols. We looked at IPv4 route tables. We looked at dynamic routing protocols like EIGRP, OSPF. We did a quick comparison of IGPs and EGPs. We looked at distance vector and link state and kind of the algorithms that they use to determine best path. And that is it for this chapter. If you have any questions or concerns, please reach out.